Uh, last March, Senator James L. Buckley of New York, who, by the way, is my brother, proposed that President Richard Nixon should resign. Not, he was careful to stipulate, by confessing his guilt uh, in the Watergate cover-up, but in order to spare him and the Republic uh, the ordeal of a prolonged impeachment trial. In due course, Mr. Nixon did resign, although by that time it was too late to leave ambiguous the question of his guilt or innocence in the cover-up. Uh, his guilt had been established by that final tape and acknowledged by every member of the House Judiciary Committee. Mr. Nixon would have been better off resigning in March and taking his tapes, Virgo and Tacta, to San Clemente with him. The week after Senator Buckley's statement last March, Time magazine commented as follows, quote, Buckley's defection had a profound effect on conservatives, particularly on those in Congress. What Buckley has done is pull a plug on the president's most important reservoir, said Howard Phillips, a Washington lobbyist for the American Conservative Union. At the very least, Time concluded, Buckley's pronouncement will force many on the right to reconsider the reasons why they want Nixon to stay in office. The Nixon experience <clears throat> and its effect on American conservatism has been neither fully analyzed nor fully understood. Senator Buckley, like a few of his colleagues in the Senate and in the House, is something of a nexus between the theoretical and the practical worlds of conservatism. Philosophically, he is a conservative as an elected official. He is buffeted by political pressures and must learn to tack against the zeitgeist. We'll explore specifically the condition of the American conservative movement with the resignation of Richard Nixon in due course. <coughs> Mr. Buckley is a graduate of Yale where he also took a law degree. After practicing a few years, he went into business in New York. His first flyer in politics was his manager of an unsuccessful mayoralty campaign in which his candidate and New York City lost. <coughs> he ran against Senator Dravitz in 1968 for the Senate unsuccessfully and won his seat in 1970, the first candidate sponsored by a third party to enter the Senate since the 1920s. I should like to begin by asking Senator Buckley whether, as things stand, he is glad that President Nixon did not resign in March when you asked him to. No, I wish that he had. I think that we would have been spared a lot of lost time, a lot of anguish. I believe that uh, we would have been entering the political season this fall uh, in a much more normal manner in which we could more truly test the, uh, the political temper. If I might just intrude a blue pencil on your introductory remarks. I did not uh, recommend a resignation in order to spare the Republic the anguish of impeachment, but rather because I had concluded back in March that the, the basis of support of the President had uh, so, been so eroded that he could no longer effectively discharge his responsibilities. In other words, we've had a, uh, a crippled president uh, for too many months now. Well, uh, th there's a lot, there's a lot uh, that happened between March and August the 9th, uh, conceitedly, and a lot that, um, that was painful to a lot of people, most particularly to Mr. Nixon. However, there was also, it seems to me, people would argue, a great deal that was accomplished between March and August, namely the, uh, the validation of Mr. Nixon's guilt on that technical point, with the result that his resignation has left a relatively divided country. Might it have been argued that if he had resigned in March, the Nixon loyalists who believed him to be completely innocent uh, would have uh, harbored a fox in their bosom. Uh, for a period of a generation or so. Not for a generation or so, for a period of uh, some months or so, because assuming that, the, that uh, Richard Nixon did not destroy his tapes, they would in time have become available. You will recall that what he released had already been uh, revealed to, to Sirica. Yes, but uh, the, the tapes that finally did him in, he still had physical custody of. And uh, if... Uh, uh, if only the tapes that were released uh, through Sirica had subsequently been published. Is it your opinion that, uh, that if Nixon had uh, resigned in March, 
the, uh, sto the story of his participation in Watergate would have crept up on him. Whatever it is, and I think that nobody knows at this time to what extent there was participation, whether it was for a period of just a few weeks or, or longer, uh, I think it would be revealed in the normal course of events. Again, on the assumption, uh, number one, that the tapes would not be destroyed, and secondly, on the basis of the fact there are a number of trials going on in which people will be testifying to the facts <coughs> as they know them in order to uh, defend themselves. So that um, you, you have no, so that under the circumstances, you, you, you do not regret your timing. No, uh, and <coughs> all of these things obviously involve uh, balances. Uh, there was no uh, joyful solution to this whole uh, situation we found ourselves in, but I think net the country would have been ahead if uh, we had closed the curtain a few months ago and uh, had operated with a frankly new administration in a situation where the political process could be more normal. Uh, it, it is, I think, the general impression that uh, what Nixon was left with uh, towards, uh, towards the end of the long siege was just the conservative vote. Uh, I think there's a sense in which that is, that is, that is correct, uh, i.e people who tend to vote conservatively in the House and uh, in the Senate were those who were uh, most uh, generally understood to be opposed to the impeachment and subsequent conviction of the president. Now, to what extent was this a completely adventitious duplication of people and issue, or to what extent did they feel that uh, the the, the defense of Richard Nixon right down to the end was a conservative obligation. I think that that uh, <coughs> tendency you speak of reflects an element of conservatism, and that, and that is a tenacious adherence to uh, not only the forms but the substance of our institutions, that there was a total uh, rejection of any impulse to presume guilt, to jump to conclusions from the scraps of evidence that had been thrown out. There is also, of course, uh, inst uh, that uh, instinct for stability, which uh, many people felt would have been seriously upset had we, had we moved uh, uh, through a resignation at, at the time that I proposed it. I think as things happened, uh, we have found that we have the capacity to move from one stage to another with remarkable ease. Well, the, the, the response to your call for resignation was widely interpreted, at least by a great many conservatives, as sort of a, a, a betrayal of them, was it not? Uh, a great many. What was, their not what was their characteristic formulation? Well, we had a little poll in, in, in our office in the mailroom as to whether I'd be compared with Judas Iscariot or Benedict Arnold or Brutus most often. Mm -hmm. And I think Benedict Arnold uh, uh, This is going from worst to best, I assume. Uh, that was in the time of uh, Washington's birthday was coming around. I guess it uh, reminded us of our own history. But this was the instinctive reaction of the, of, uh, the people who are closest, uh, with whom I feel mo most closely identified, my constituency and uh, certainly Richard Nixon's. Mm -hmm. But there were many others who knew exactly what I was trying to say and who agreed with me. Unfortunately, more of them tas uh, uh, privately than publicly. Uh, now, ha has, there, has there been any, any movement in the people who were critical in March now, or um, is, is it the problem that, that people tend generally not to uh, look for an opportunity to recognize that they... I've had, had uh, several wrong. hundred letters of the people saying that we uh, wrote you angrily back in March and we believe on retrospect as things have developed that you're, you're right. Was that when they heard that Howard Cosell was going to run against you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I understand that some uh, surprising uh, counties are willing to be counted on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, uh, what I'm, what I'm uh, approaching perhaps clumsily is that uh, it is not widely known that although for the formal reasons that you outline, i.e. a reluctance to be moved by mobocratic impulse. Conservatives stuck by Nixon. There was nevertheless an undercurrent of mostly unpublicized dissatisfaction. Now let me quote you a couple of sentences from Evans and Novak, uh, written three weeks before your call for the re resignation of Nixon. He said, they said, although the meeting on February the 6th between President Nixon and 21 conservative House Republicans opened with applause and ended with handshakes. 
These amenities were merely a veneer for seething anti-Nixon sentiment by the entire conservative Republican establishment. The Nixon sellout of their position on issue after issue has caused this. Quote, that sellout, conservatives agree, uh, has its source in Watergate and the conviction that the president's new budget is designed to appease the main force of his enemy, liberals of both parties, said Representative Edward Dewinsky of Illinois, leader of the steering group, uh, he, who told us this after the session and, to, and had told the president politely that, quote, he could not placate his liberal critics with this new deficit budget and program. Is, is that uh, a faithful representation of uh, the conservative mood in Congress? No, that, that is a faithful uh, representation of one element in it. But uh, I would also point out that there are any number of liberals who started talking about Watergate politics uh, in reference to what they believe to be a feints to the right. Uh, I did uh, speak with one reporter. Faint by Nixon to the right. Okay. Yes, uh -huh. yes. An appeasement of, uh, of, of uh, the people who would, who would end up judging him. That's right. Uh, so, uh, but I, I've talked to one reporter who made the rounds, and he came to the conclusion that the consensus was that if Nixon was in fact playing Watergate politics, he was playing it very poorly. Uh, I, I just honestly don't think that that was uh, uh, what was behind uh, the so-called sellouts. I believe there was confusion. I believe that on issue after issue, he wasn't adequately informed. And I believe, too, that the 1975 fiscal budget reflected not so much a political maneuver as rather a surrender uh, by Richard Nixon because of a preoccupation with the Watergate affair as such. In other words, he, he just was giving up the fight for some kind of fiscal pr uh, uh, prudence. Uh, gi giving it up because of a lack of time. And lack of support. Uh -huh. Not giving was, it up. I believe this was one of the things that uh, caused me to believe that he was, he'd, he'd moved into a period where he could no longer move events, but was being moved by them. Okay, well, moving uh, a month uh, uh, before, in January 1974, there was a meeting in Washington of a lot of conservatives, and I think you addressed them at one point. Uh, here, is, here was the lead story in the Washington Post. Quote, President Nixon was depicted yesterday by troubled conservatives as a man who had betrayed his principles and permitted the office of the presidency to be used. Ronald Doxai, president of the Young Americans for Freedom, said Mr. Nixon should, quote, either make a complete open explanation to Congress of his role in the Watergate affair or quit the presidency. Representative John Ashbrook of Ohio said the president had broken practically every campaign promise on major domestic and foreign policy issues. He said that conservatives could be destroyed in the 1974 election by blindly following Mr. Nixon's leadership. Quote, I don't happen to belong to that branch of the sheep family that follows a bellwether over the precipice. Now, if there was that kind of dissatisfaction, again, I'm wondering why Nixon didn't uh, emerge as a separate entity from the conservative movement in America. Did he, did he not overwhelm it in Congress? Well, I believe that uh, conservatives such as you and other writers, uh, commentators, and so on, have never claimed Richard Nixon to be an ideological conservative. And therefore, that lead paragraph you just read, I think, misstates the case from the, from the beginning. Uh, yes, there were conservatives. In fact, I think most responsible conservatives <coughs> from the begin from at the outset were urging, uh, urging President Nixon privately to come out and say everything he knew. And also, of course, they took at face value the statements that he had, had done precisely that. But uh, when you talk about the issues and so on, I, I think that we've, what we have is a situation of a, of a man who is perceived, or has been perceived as being conservative in the body politic, whose instincts are conservative, many of whose programs were demonstrably conservative, but who was nevertheless capable of imposing wage and price controls, capable of a, of a family uh, uh, family assistance program, uh, capable of any number of specifics uh, where he totally veered away from uh, what the conservative movement is all about. So I don't, I don't see this in terms of, of, a, of a betrayal so much as the fact you're, you're talking about a pragmatic politician uh, maneuvering in a situation which was increasingly difficult. Has anyone got a handkerchief? Uh, well, if it was increasingly... Thanks a lot. Oh, I was going over to you. Uh, you better hang on to it. The, <clears throat> it was increasingly difficult, for, but uh, 
Uh, is it or is it not a fair historical judgment given, uh, given the perspectives of this moment to say that Mr. Uh, Mr. Nixon's policies were so confusing as regards conservative priorities domestically and internationally that he has left uh, the conservative movement uh, 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 scattered, uh, slightly incoherent, and perhaps even emasculated. I believe that's true from this perspective and this perspective only, and that is he preempted, he w was regarded and described in the press and the editorials and so forth as the conservatism. Yeah. And also there is another aspect to this whole thing, and that is that uh, because on such significant balance, I believe he was in fact conservative in his policies, and at least with the programs that, that he proposed of putting into effect, that there was a tendency to, to, uh, to back him up. And I think that perhaps here, the conservatives early on let him down by not describing the positions explicitly, perhaps in, in advance of the effect, so as to have provided him with greater maneuverability. In other words, I think that there was a, a too great a willingness to accommodate Richard Nixon rather than uh, doing what the liberals are apt to do, and that is to hammer home uh, that uh, program that they believe is in the best interest of the country. What would be a concrete example of that? I believe uh, <coughs> some of the, uh, first of all, in the wage price controls. Uh, the, my understanding is that when that uh, the, the authority, standby authority, was voted, there were only a handful of people in the entire s Congress who voted against him. It seems to me that that was a point where the conservatives, uh, who, after all, understand the history of what happens when you try to arbitrarily control uh, inflation in, the, in this manner, knowing that it would not work, that was the time to have supported Nixon in fact, and saying this is unthinkable. You may recall that, uh, that, the, uh, that uh, Richard Nixon explicitly asked that he not be granted the authority. Mm -hmm. But there should have been a campaign, there should have been a massive vote against it. But there was a sort of a timidity. I think there, there is uh, one uh, uh, great area there. Yeah, I think it's an interesting area, but it's, it's also one that reflects uh, in, a number of problems that uh, conservatives have, and I suppose liberals have uh, also, uh, which is the political problem of communicating to people who want snake oil, that they shouldn't want snake oil. I'm using uh, Milton Friedman's terms. If, um, if people insist on snake oil and they run themselves through their elected representatives, uh, then the moment comes when you simply capitulate and when they eventually find out that it doesn't work the miracles that had been advertised, they, they tire of it as they soon enough did. And now there isn't much of a cry for it. So, uh, so is that the best example, really? Uh, or do you think that the damage done by wage and price controls uh, exceeded the benefits of the lesson we learned about its inefficacy? Well, I, I, I believe that one of the problems uh, that we constantly confront in a, in a, in a society such as ours is uh, the need uh, to educate. And I believe that it, it is a responsibility of being uh, in the Congress to try to explain what the issues are. Uh, after all, it's your job to wrestle with them, to, to do the research, to, to look back into history, to examine, to uh, uh, project. And I believe that if we relegate the job of Congress to that of just reacting to popular stimuli, we're not doing the public a favor. Uh, but there are, there are other areas, uh, and I think, for example, that the conservatives ought to have been a little more energetic on national defense. Uh, uh, there was that uh, tremendous wave of uh, anti-militarism uh, during the height, the, the, the tail end of the Vietnam conflict, when there were some uh, rather brutal slashes in, in defense uh, appropriations, uh, slashes from which we're suffering now, in terms of uh, fundamental areas of research and development. Now, in my judgment, the president probably struck as good a bargain as he could with the Congress, given its mood. But I think it would have been helpful to him and also helpful to the public and might have turned the corner a little sooner had uh, the conservatives uh, frankly spoken out as to why it is that we've got a, a defense establishment in the first place, why it is that a certain amount of money has to be spent if we're going to preserve our own freedoms. But isn't, isn't it true that, uh, that, uh, that uh, self-satisfaction of Congress was only partly a reaction to the anti-militarism of Vietnam, but it was uh, at it was highly stimulated 
by Mr. Nixon's uh, rhetoric about bringing us uh, a generation of peace. I'm there, talking there about, no, I'm talking about uh, uh, what appropriations about. prior to that rhetoric. That rhetoric uh, followed Peking and, and Moscow. Mm -hmm. Uh, but already the, uh, the administration's hands were being circumscribed by the willingness of the Congress to appropriate. As a matter of fact, the first time I met uh, uh, Secretary Kissinger, he did suggest that the conservatives had done Richard Nixon a disfavor by not being more adamant in their own positions so as to make it possible for, for the Nixon to have a larger playground. By definition, the center moves to the right if the right moves to the right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, is the uh, you, you speak you speak about this as being uh, a problem of the past? Are you saying that uh, Congress is pretty well consolidated now in acknowledging the necessity of a realistic defense establishment? Not quite to the extent that I would uh, like to see it, but I, I I believe that in this last year we have seen some uh, significant uh, reawakening uh, to some of the realities, and I believe that the October War in the Middle East had a great deal to do with that when suddenly we found the Soviet Union moving ships into the Mediterranean that were more than a match for ours, uh, new weapons that they were giving to the Egyptians that we didn't even have in our own inventory, things of that sort. Uh, I think it, it, it uh, brought us down to earth. Uh, you will note that uh, a, a very real departure was finally adopted, and that is the d spending of money to develop more accurate missiles so that instead of being limited to blotting out Moscow or some other major city, we can go after uh, Soviet missiles. So this sort of thing. After wherever Brezhnev's going to hide. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see. Well, why, 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 is it, um, uh, why is it that we always think of it as axiomatic that conservatives should be in favor of uh, uh, arming and uh, liberals uh, on the other side when the situation was exactly the opposite as recently as 40 years ago? I have a feeling, that I like to think that the difference between uh, uh, conservatives and, and uh, liberals in a very fundamental way is that conservatives are realists. Uh, the, 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 the threats that the United States actually uh, had to worry about uh, in 1940 were quite different from 1970. We have, after all, intercontinental ballistic missiles now and nuclear warheads. This just simply was, there was not 40 years ago, a plausible threat of an armed attack on the United States. There is such a threat today. Or the possibility, anyway. It's, it's, it's something that's feasible. And, uh, and the, 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 the data that you give are, are presumably apprehensible by people of any political stripe. I mean, George McGovern knows that we've invented intercontinental missiles, right. doesn't he? But I'm so talking there's about... Got, there's, uh, got, there's got to be another reason. I talked about uh, uh, a reality. Mm -hmm. and, and that is that, and this is one of the things, by the way, that, that uh, bothers me about the policy of detente as it has become uh, to be understood by too many people, namely that uh, the aggressive nature of all mankind has suddenly uh, uh, taken leave uh, for our generation. It's not true. We saw that again in the Middle Eastern uh, uh, conflict. Uh, Millennialism. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and the fact is, we've got to live with the here and now and live with the threats as they exist and hope they never, never occur. And I believe, too, that, uh, again, as part of the historical perspective that I do believe conservatives bring to the politics of this country, we understand that uh, it is when a potential adversary is weak that aggressive states are tempted uh, to invade, uh, to pull power uh, uh, plays. But precisely when there is strength, are we apt to see peace? Well, the, uh, we, we, are, we are talking about uh, the Nixon experience and the conservative uh, movement in America, and it seems, um, uh, it seems to me plain that although you can cite individual speeches of Mr. Nixon, and we, he talked about the necessity to, uh, to be fully armed, to meet any threat, and so on and so forth, there is a factual historical record of a capitulation on a number of points. In the early part of his administration, he simply said, look, the future of America requires uh, ABMs. A couple of years later, he signed uh, 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 a treaty abolishing uh, all but a very restricted use of uh, uh, ABMs. The, 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 the devotion in his rhetoric to the idea that he was bringing us peace for the balance of the century uh, certainly encouraged 
even some quote conservatives to believe that if Nixon thought that we were sufficiently uh, on guard against any military contingency, who were they with their um, miserable store of relative knowledge to contradict him? studio you have here. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, so, so, so under the circumstances, isn't it, a, isn't it, isn't it going to take a while to, uh, to instruct the conservative community, if indeed it, it is its special responsibility as realists, to look after the military, uh, to, to rescue it? Yeah from the kind of lethargy into which it sank under Nixon. One, one of the problems that um, I think we saw in this whole development is one where, despite the fact that Richard Nixon uh, was uh, proclaimed to be such an astute politician, and I think in his handling of Watergate he was shown not to be, but also here was another aspect where he was not. Uh, he, when he spoke about detente, when he spoke about the ability to negotiate, when he spoke about the uh, uh, interim agreement, he at the same time talked about the absolute necessity for strength and, pr and uh, uh, proposed budgets that would minimally have supported uh, these positions. I think minimally. Uh, what he, I don't think that he adequately assessed was the fact that the mere talk about detente and the rhetoric about uh, uh, peace in our, our age diffused any willingness on the part of uh, too many people to continue to spend the dollars that he stated had to be spent in order for him to keep talking. Uh, but as I say, I, th I think that, that uh, events of the last uh, year have served to put a little spine back into uh, a lot of backs, where, where the necessary backs, but n not yet in sufficient the, degree. That, not that's when we close down the bases in Massachusetts. <laughs> right. <laughs> <clears throat> there are other areas, I, I might say, that where I, I believe that, that uh, Richard Nixon was genuinely speaking a conservative position and where I believe he was serious, and that is this business of cutting back the, the accretion of power in Washington, this, uh, the, uh, rolling back the historic flow. And yes, I know the exceptions, uh, the family assistance program being, being one large one. Or maximizing the incumbents. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, there were many programs that were uh, starting to work up so-called special revenue sharing, which would have started returning responsibilities, real uh, authority and responsibility to the states. And this is one area where I believe the events of Watergate absolutely frustrated his initiatives and his ability to carry forward. And, uh, th and this, this, you think, will probably revive under President Ford, or is it too early to tell? I think it's too early to tell. I uh, certainly hope that he will revive them. Uh, what, there's one curious thing about the rhetoric of, of this transitional period. You keep on uh, reading the Washington Post and the New York Times talking about healing the divisions. Well, the divisions have not been ideological divisions. You might say the divisions have been within the conservative movement, for example. But the one central fact of recent years is that in November of 1972, in an election where the issues were more clearly defined in terms of liberal versus conservative than ever before, the American public spoke out strongly and explicitly for a change of direction. So I've, uh, and nothing that has happened since then has uh, worked to undercut that mandate. It is there, it is strong, and I hope that uh, President Ford fully appreciates that and utilizes the enormous uh, honeymoon period of goodwill that he has and rightfully has to carry that uh, mandate forward. Yes, but, 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 people tend very often to associate an idea with, with a person. And if, if that person lets them down, they become disillusioned with the idea. Here's uh, a, a, an excellent example is, of course, the by-elections this spring where people who were sore at Nixon voted for McGovern types in staunchly Republican districts. Yes, but here are uh, two things are very Either clear from this. Either or punitively. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, two things very clear there. Number one, that an awful lot of people who had given that margin of support stayed home. Number two, because of the t intense focus of national uh, attention on these uh, a half dozen uh, uh, races, the people in th there thought they were being called upon to telegraph messages uh, to the country. And this has been uh, verified in poll after poll and in post-election uh, uh, interviews. Th to me, the really pertinent uh, uh, data uh, uh, comes from such studies as one uh, published recently by a, a Senate subcommittee on American attitudes towards government. And the robust conclusion of two-thirds of the people, and this is one of the detailed, in-depth ones, was that two-thirds of the American people felt that we had to take power away from the federal government and had to reinforce state governments on issues such as the care of the aged, on health, 
the, 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 uh, the consensus was keep the federal government out of it. Let's rely on private institutions and on state and local initiatives. And poll after poll has underscored the fact that although at the polls you have seen in half a dozen elections different results, in terms of American attitudes, that move towards the right is continuing. Would you say that the appointment of uh, Nelson Rockefeller is, is uh, harmonious uh, with that insight? Uh, certainly not as the American uh, uh, people perceive uh, the attitudes of, of uh, Nelson Rockefeller. Now, now, you and I know that in New York State in his last two years, uh, he moved uh, uh, in a number of uh, uh, very visible ways uh, uh, to the right. And uh, well, of course, the alternative was bankruptcy. <laughs> Uh, well, th there are other issues uh, in terms of the drug legislation and so on. Now, as, as happens to anybody in public life, there are those who impugn his motives. Uh, uh, but it, as I say, I think that from our perspective, he is far more consonant with those uh, 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 views than uh, the Americans generally believe. Well, now, is uh, the, 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 the notion of paying as you go is um, a conservative uh, uh, axiom. Uh, Richard Nixon uh, overspent more than any peacetime president in American history, including Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He did so in pursuit of a, uh, what, I, what I happen to think of as a will-o'-wisp, which is the so-called full employment budget, which you once defended, and which uh, I, I think Professor Milton Friedman still defends. Are you prepared to acknowledge that it was a mistake? I said that in theory, I believe, uh, that it was defensible. I feared that in practice, people would, would uh, lose sight of that magic divide between that which is full employment and something in excess thereof. But again, I think it's important to understand that uh, a president is, uh, in terms of the volume of spending, unless he is explicitly recommending the increases, he is the captive of the Congress. Now, you may recall that in uh, November and December of 1972, uh, uh, Nixon impounded or pocket vetoed about $15 billion worth of appropriations. And the first thing the Congress did when they came back was to pass legislation to outlaw impoundments. So that I, 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 I don't think we can blame the full amount of those deficits on Richard Nixon. He had no choice but to spend them. But I do agree that uh, the, uh, the, 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 however theoretically plausible full employment budgeting is, as a practical matter, it, it, it's uh, too dangerous. It, 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 it is true, I think, though, that um, used loosely, the word Keynesianism uh, is uh, associated in the public mind with uh, an inflationary approach aimed at full employment. Mm -hmm. And when Nixon said that he, too, was a Keynesian uh, several years ago, however imprecisely he, he used the word, of uh, that, uh, hand in hand, with his refusal to campaign against uh, high deficit spending, uh, gave the impression that the conservative movement has now come to terms with reality, and that the reality is that you must endure inflation, not quite as much as we have now, which has become unpopular, but certainly as much uh, as uh, we had uh, or were facing then, four, five, six, seven percent. Is it your judgment that there is now a reaction against that kind of acquiescence that Nixon showed towards deficit spending? Uh, there definitely is. Times are too serious to, uh, to be agreeable. And I think that uh, undoubtedly politics went into uh, that kind of statement. And I think politics probably went into the acquiescence with it within the Congress. Uh, and I think one of the, one of the, the, the uh, damages that has been done to the Republican Party in the whole exercise is to fuzz uh, that uh, uh, the ability of Republicans to assert that they do stand for, for f strict fiscal responsibility. But uh, certainly in the last two years, uh, within the Congress, it has been uh, the conservatives who have been questioning uh, the deficits, who have been working against them, working to cut back on appropriations. And the virus is catching a little bit. And that is because I think, frankly, people are scared. They are scared, but don't know, or do they, yes, or do they not know what to do? Are they or are they not listening to Democrats more than Republicans as regards prescriptions? In, back in June, 74 senators voted to uh, 
pr uh, impose a $275 billion uh, ceiling on spending. The problem is in getting 51 senators to agree as to where you make the necessary cuts. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the Congress has uh, developed uh, elaborate machinery that is supposed to, within a year, uh, start uh, shaving expenses, making the decisions to fit within uh, what is prudent spending. I have my fingers crossed. I hope it works. It needs to be worked. But I will say this, that I have seen an instance after instance where uh, 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 committee chairmen and so on have put the brakes on new proposals and have shaved back on some of the old ones. They haven't shaved back enough, but there is an awareness now that deficits create inflation. Mr. Tom Sullickson. <clears throat> Senator Buckley, I agree with you that uh, ex-president Nixon did veer away from some conservative principles in his use of Keynesian economic policies, his uh, unbalanced budget, and his recognition, recognition of red China. Uh, now we have a new president, President It Ford. isn't yet recognized, incidentally. Pardon me. Red China is not yet recognized. That's what? a formalism, though, I think. Okay. Uh, now we have a new president, President Ford, who, um, while it, it is too soon to tell, seems to be taking a few tentative steps away from sort of right-wing positions after a long career as a conservative congressman. What I think has to be explored, and I don't think it's been brought up here this afternoon, is the degree to which both these men are reacting to uh, what they consider to be the political climate in the 1970s, a climate that in reaction to the polarization of the 60s now seems to be taking a centralist orientation to the degree to which Perhaps the 70s may duplicate the uh, experience of the 50s, which was characterized as essentially non-ideological. Now, I wonder how you reconcile that apparent tendency with your statement before the American Conservative Political Action Conference, uh, and I quote, that any political party that forthrightly builds its platform on the bedrock of, Amer of conservative principle will be the majority party of the 1980s. Now, what is it that you see that makes you so sanguine, or is that just wishful uh, the thinking? The poll, uh, the, the, the uh, election of uh, 1972, and the polls that have come out uh, subsequently, the uh, uh, those issues that tend to be the concerns of the people. There's a whole body of evidence, and one of the things that concerns me is that in seeking this centralist position, if you will, that people uh, not lose sight of the American people. If you're seeking the center position in the Congress of the United States, which I think is about 15 years behind the people in its attitudes on specific issues, uh, then you'll be moving significantly to the left of uh, what the American people voted for in the last referendum on, on what they want for this country. So that I, 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 I hope that as the Ford administration coalesces its own program and moves forward, that it will be centering on the public consensus and not on, on, on the Congress. And I believe that a party that it does identify itself with what is today that consensus, as described in, uh, two or three weeks ago in Time Magazine and polls published in the New York Times and so on, that the Republican Party then does have the opportunity of becoming the majority party for the simple reason that tens of millions of traditional Democrats no longer have any use uh, uh, for their party's leadership. It's only because of Democrats that I was elected to this office, only because of Democrats that Richard Nixon was elected to his office. Ms. Kathy Vogel. Yes, Senator Buckley, when you mentioned before that uh, the conservative was the realist, I'm curious that this is a little not quite Mr. Nixon only, but in the democratic system and we, where we have an undeclared war and people decide not to go to war, and then the liberals say that we should give them amnesty and the conservatives say we shouldn't or uh, and you know then we decide well maybe alternate excuse me alternate service is possibly the better answer it seems to me that the conservatives find alternate service not a very good answer and i would say that the liberals find it you know both a realistic and a just answer and i'm curious to know why you consider that you know unrealistic as it were i, I believe that uh the ultimate realism is to understand that the laws have got to be honored and that you've got to have this kind of stability through your society. This doesn't mean that you can't be compassionate. This doesn't mean that you cannot take cases individually and judge them against the circumstances and determine whether in a given case there have been sufficient extenuating circumstances, a, a sufficient depth of conviction to, uh, to justify a, a forgiveness. And I, I frankly believe that this is what our legal system is all about. I don't think you can find anywhere in the world uh, a system as flexible or judges as willing to give this kind of consideration. In other words, I think you have in being an amnesty board. 
And in point of fact, if you regard the people who've come back and have been processed, I think over half of them have, in effect, been let off. Mr. Herbert, stop. It seems to me that the things that endeared Richard Nixon to conservatives at the grassroots level and Republicans at the grassroots level were the dramatic things, uh, things that he did uh, perhaps for show, dating all the way back to Alger Hiss and then perhaps most recently to the uh, bombing of uh, the areas around Hanoi. Given that, I'm wondering, despite the fact that Gerald Ford's uh, House Minority Leadership, as opposed to Rich Richard Nixon's uh, presidency, was more conservative, Gerald Ford's tenure was more conservative, will it be easier for conservative office holders like yourself to criticize uh, President Ford's liberal initiatives than uh, the similar vein in, with, with Richard Nixon? Will it be easier for you to criticize President Ford than President Nixon? I, of course, came on board halfway through uh, uh, President Nixon's first term. But I can see where, with a change of command, there were enormous institutional difficulties. But I believe that uh, under today's circumstances that there will not be that uh, reluctance to stand firm on positions that are perceived to be right. Uh, and, and I don't think either that people will think that this is somehow uh, cutting a honeymoon short. I think uh, actually each one of us has got his own responsibilities uh, to, to, to uh, his constituents and to the system to be counted and in, in, in the context of what uh, Secretary Kissinger told me and, and where I think he was right. I think that we can best help President Ford by standing up and being counted and delineating the, our positions as forcefully as we can. Mr. Uh, Seligson? Uh, liberals and radicals, mm. for that matter, have been complaining about the uh, excessive the growth of the power of the presidency, pre pre presidency excuse me, since World War II. Um, much of the, uh, of the reaction against the Vietnam War had to do with the, the excessive power uh, exercised by uh, pr President Johnson. Now since Watergate, we have another very candid example of this kind of presidential arrogance and abuse of power through the Watergate tapes. And uh, a reaction to this seems to be a growing revitalization of the Congress and a reassertion of uh, legislative, legislative uh, prerogatives. Now, I'm wondering if, if how you, as a conservative who is committed to a government of the uh, lowest competent authority, views this um, new this shift in power from the executive to the legislative branch. But first of all, I would say that uh, the Watergate episode and others leading up to, to it, uh, in, in very real senses, I think illustrate the fundamental conservative principle, and that is if you uh, concentrate enough power, especially discretionary or arbitrary power in any one place, at some point or another, it's going to be abused. And of course, there was nothing, this has been happening over the years. Uh, now, yes, the Congress is now reasserting prerogatives, but I have, frankly, strong res doubts as to whether or not the Congress can sustain uh, this reassertion of its own uh, 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 theoretical e equality because of the simple fact that the Congress is so overloaded loaded with uh, scraps of work that it can't maintain its attention uh, uh, span. And uh, all through the rhetoric of the last year and a half about the abuse of executive powers and about the need to do something about it, I have been involved in a dozen pieces of legislation through my committees in which still further authority is granted to federal functionaries. And all of that comes under the office of the president. So that I, 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 uh, uh, I'm delighted to see that we are once again uh, aware and concerned. But I wonder, frankly, if in a, 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 at a future time when you have a president and uh, the majority control of the Congress in, in the same political hands, whether there will be quite that attention to uh, the prerogative. What is the solution there? I mean, if, is it is it for is a solution for the federal government simply to decline to take on more and to uh, divest itself? Uh, divestiture. divestiture, divestiture on back to the states. Right. Uh, uh, in, in in point of fact, or the private sector. Perhaps. We've developed a kind of a fourth branch of government now, a, a huge sprawling bureaucracy where any number of people have uh, the power of life and death over other individuals economically, uh, druggists, uh, people trying to float a new company, farmers, and so on. 
and radio uh, there's station the owners. radio station owners and so on. And, and there is literally no way that the, a president can oversee all of that. Uh, but uh, to the extent that individuals have a, a, a huge uh, a spectrum of, of, uh, of discretion, that discretion can be abused, and the abuse can be uh, uh, conscious. So I think we've got uh, uh, at least the power in, in Bill to bully. I think what we need to do is to carry that special revenue sharing concept through and decide what it is that can be handled, in fact, uh, at the state level or, or local levels, and I think most things can, and then get the federal regulators out, and at least we would have brought those, uh, uh, those uh, uh, bureaucracies under more direct scrutiny. Uh, un unless we are prepared to do that, I don't think that we will in the long run solve this particular problem. Well, is it possible to muster the political power to uh, resist the bureaucracy, uh, or is it, as has widely been alleged, uh, uh, an enemy, uh, a unit, so formidable in the cultivation of its own self-interest that you just can't succeed against it? You're speaking very monolithic, and uh, incidentally, there are any number of people in public service who are extraordinarily dedicated and try to be fair. No, I don't mean that, but, but they have, they, 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 there is a self-interest. There is a self-interest, and each one has its own constituency. Uh, it, it can be done, but it is only going to be done if there is a determination to do it. A vision. A vision, and even then, it is only going to be done if you change the management and the Congress. I, I just don't believe that people who have uh, spent uh, half a legislative lifetime building these agencies can bring themselves to re-educate themselves to tearing them down. Yeah. I think you've got to bring in new blood, uh, people who really believe in federalism and put into action. And infanticide. Right. <laughs> uh, Ms. Fogel. Yes, earlier, Senator Buckley, you said um, when you had called for the resignation in March that you felt that it would have precluded what you referred to, I think, as some, a state of disarray politically, that we are in the temper, the political temper being... But that wasn't my reason, but that is uh, a side effect, yes. Um, no, I know that wasn't your reason. I just, it, was, it came out of part of what you were saying. And I was just curious to know what you thought of the fact that, you know, I, I grant you that the facts at the time may have been enough that the president should have resigned, and Lord knows I felt he should have, but that's relevant. The point is that um, what we saw in Congress during those impeachment hearings, I felt had an incredible effect on this country, that the congressmen themselves all rose to the occasion of their office, um, as opposed to what we had been witness to in the highest office in this country. And I just wondered what you felt, you know, ha the effect of that has on the Congress today as a body, as a unified political but non-political body, you know, representational government. Well, I think those hearings demonstrated what uh, too few people are willing to admit, and that is this enorm enormous amount of quality in the Congress, and that people are uh, trying to do the best job possible. I'd say the large majority of the people in, in uh, the House and in the Senate, they're conscientious, dedicated people, and the whole historic uh, flavor of the occasion brought out the best. But I'd, I'd, I believe that a, a, a trial would have taken on quite a different flavor. Number one, you never would have seen a senator. Uh, would have been because uh, senators are not allowed to talk in, during the uh, course of an impeachment trial, except uh, when they're arguing a point of procedure or a motion. If, uh, uh, a, if, if uh, a member of the Can't Senate... Can you question a witness? You can send a written question to the chief judge, presiding okay. judge, who will then ask it. But in effect, you won't see the, the members How of the Senate... How could Senator Weicker put up with that? Well... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it, it, it's a different thing, like and it also be attenuated. You, you would have... Uh, uh, Counsel for the defense, counsel, the prosecuting uh, uh, attorneys who would have been congressmen and so on, and it would have gone on quite possibly month after month after endless month with uh, the president of the United States in the docks. He didn't have to be president. He didn't have to be president, no. but symbolically he would have been there. Yeah, yeah. So, so in other words, it, it would not have uh, provided an opportunity for senators individually to, um, to either show their, uh, yeah. their great statesmanship or to ham it up. I don't yeah, know. right, 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 right. Mr. Sullivan? Oh, I'm sorry, it's, oh. it's Herbert. Uh, Herb. uh, it's, it's been suggested that the executive branch of government is about to become an adjunct of the uh, Rockefeller Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if you would welcome either Nelson Rockefeller stepping down uh, at the end of his term in 1977 voluntarily or being replaced on the Republican ticket in 1976, either because of age or other reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I frankly don't want to get into any sort of a personal evaluations of the situation. My understanding of the 25th Amendment, the amendment under which he was named, is that it is a prerogative of the president to nominate and that the Congress would be uh, st overstepping if they used personal judgments rather than in actual impediments. Uh, for a decision to vote against. Now, I mean, is, that, is that written into the debates of the 25th Amendment, or, or do you just infer this? Uh, it has been so testified to, or at least uh, informally, by a number of the people who uh, authored it, uh, Congressman Seller, for example. What reason did Congressman Rodino, head of, the, head of that important Judiciary Committee, give for voting against Gerald Ford? Uh, I don't know what reason he gave, but I know some reasons other people gave which were political. I see. I see. You wanted to amplify that question? Now, that in, of course, anybody is entitled to interpret any clause of the Constitution as. I'm, I'm just giving you my own interpretation. I'm wondering about. You got to vote for Rockefeller to confirm If that? I do not see any impediment. And this, of course, is why you have hearings and investigations and all the rest of it. Will you consult a canonical court? <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering whether or not you'd welcome his stepping down as vice president in 77 or being replaced on the Republican ticket as opposed to voting for him. Uh, here in, yeah. during the hearing. I don't think that anyone should re regard uh, the, the, the present ticket as that which is foreordained to run in 76. Uh, and I think that we have to wait to see what the, what the flavor is in 76 to make any kind of judgment of that kind. It's, it's terribly hard to unstick a vice president, isn't it? I mean, it hasn't it's been hard. done since Henry Wallace. And uh, it's unlikely that, that Mr. Ford will develop the imperial habits mm -hmm. of FDR. Mm -hmm. It takes four, four right. times as president. Well, what I'm trying to say is I don't think mm -hmm. that I have a right to insert a political judgment. Yeah into the equation of will I or will I, vo will I not vote for confirmation. It has to be some... Yeah, I think that's, a, that's an obvious and, and uh, honorable distinction. Um, Mr. Tullickson. I can't resist the temptation to ask a political question. Uh, seeing as if you're up for re-election in 76, and um, you also have a certain um, influence as the foremost conservative spokesman, I'm wondering what your reaction is going to be to uh, the uh, campaign for re-election of... Uh, your senator, senator from New York, Javits, in the forthcoming November. Not aware that that's relevant to our subject under here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've got, I've got uh, a, a, a disposition that is uh, institutional. Number one, that I'm a vice chairman of the Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee, and this precludes me from uh, going to bat against an incumbent. Also, there's a strong institutional prohibition against whether you let's assume that uh, uh, Senator Javits were a Democrat. Uh, the institutional prohibitions are against going to bed even in those circumstances, and I think rightfully so. You've got to work together on matters of interest to your state. By the same token, I obviously can't go in and uh, uh, campaign for him. It's too well known, I couldn't do it plausibly, it's too well known that we're on opposite sides of the fence of too many important issues. Well, that's a pretty good answer, isn't it? Oh, yes, I'll accept it. That's what I was expecting. Ms. Fogel? Um, Senator Buckley, I also I wondered earlier, you said about the fact that um, the liberals have reawakened to the need for defense in this country, and I wondered specifically... Well, not, not, not in sufficient quantities. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but what, why exactly do you feel that, um, what, is, what is happening today, that this, you feel is, there's a dramatic change in the, the liberals? Well, we, we saw uh, the okay. fact that, in, in the, again, going back to that October war, yeah. we saw, number one, that uh, the way the Soviets read detente is totally different from the way uh, too many Americans do. In other words, the Soviets are willing to plunge in and in, uh, heat up the, the flames uh, to encourage other Arabs to join in, to encourage oil boycotts, and also to fly in huge quantities of equipment. Number two, whereas until very recently we were able to regard the Mediterranean as our pond, we now see that the Soviets were able to, to, to throw in more ships and more modern ships than we had. And there is a very serious question as to whether or not uh, the Sixth Fleet will, in time, if it still can, maintain its strategic functions. Number three, we find that the Soviets not only have in supply, but in sufficient supply to, to hand over to the Syrians and Egyptians weapons of a sophistication we don't have. So suddenly, we, it, it, we could see in naked power terms the extent to which we are falling behind, and some people are also in that context reading the implications of, of, of uh, falling behind. What too few people understand, and I think they were reminded last October, and that is that the foreign policy and military strength go hand in hand. If you don't have the military strength to make your policy plausible, then p policy becomes uh, 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 an exercise in futility. We can't have a Middle East, uh, uh, a Middle East uh, uh, 
stands. We can't have a policy with respect to Israel, for example, unless we have the hardware. Mr. Stop. I'm not sure this is a fair question, Senator Buckley, but had it gone uh, to the Senate trial of Richard Nixon, do you think most conservative Republicans in the Senate would have voted for conviction? I think that's an unfair question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I'd say uh, also, I, I, I believe that, especially among the conservatives, and I believe the great majority of all of them, there is a, was a willing shielding, blocking off mentally, of, of drawing any conclusions from the kind of uh, uh, evidence or hearsay or whatever that got into the press. It was our job to walk into that chamber with as clean a mind as we could and then assess the evidence. Mm -hmm. Fine. Yeah. Future shock, they call it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also, there are two questions there that are involved. Number one, was there evidence to support the allegations? And number two, were the allegations sufficient to, uh, uh, to support uh, impeachment? A conviction. Uh, well, uh, c certainly you can answer this question. Uh, in your judgment, were the allegations sufficient enough to warrant the recommendation of the Judiciary Committee? I'm not going to substitute my, my judgment for theirs. They obviously felt so to a, to a man. And uh, then the question is, would the facts validate? It's one of these things where uh, you, you, you could ha you, I think that the, those articles were such that the sum of the parts could have added up to more. Uh, the whole could have added up to more than some of the parts. To was a there a pattern? Yes. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the difficult things that we would have had to unthread. Yes, but... Uh, but certainly I have no criticism whatsoever for, on, uh, as to the action taken by the Judiciary Committee. Well, if you have no criticism whatsoever, you, you, you can't then say that they acted recklessly. Oh, no, no, no. But, but you're not prepared to say whether your own vote would have been the same as their own. No, and I, and I would be listening to something to which they did not listen, namely a trial. Here in a trial. Thank you very much, Senator Buckley. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen of the panel, ladies and gentlemen. Next week, attorney Chesterfield Smith joins Mr. Buckley for an exchange of ideas on the prosecution of Nixon. line post office box 5966 columbia south carolina 29250 production funding provided by public television stations the ford foundation and the corporation for public broadcasting <laughs>